Thanks for coming along to start up. Uh, we have a normal format to, to how we run things here. Um, first of all, who's a, who's a newbie? Oh, wow. Okay, do you want to quickly go around and say how you found us, what you put here, and what your interest is? Sure. Uh, if you've got a startup, more importantly. <laughs> Oh, my name's Bear Cruz, and uh, born in Africa, but kind of grew up all over the world and in the moment. And I'm just really curious to see what the store of scene is like here. Who else is right now? Yeah. Uh, apologies. Um, I'm an engineer by, uh, by uh, training, but I have a few slides to consult with. But I uh, want to learn more about Yep, I'm David. Um, I've been burnt. I work for two weeks at the desert on a motorcycle for two weeks off. Yeah, uh, Mason. I'm just like developing an app and here to rebuild my team, network, and all that cool Thanks. stuff. But Thanks. yeah. I'm um, Rob. I came here about six months ago a few times and thought I'd touch base again. And, you know, still like the topic. Brilliant. So we're looking to build the, uh, the morning startup um, brand what we're doing in the scene. Um, what we normally do is like, give you some announcements. We do have a Facebook page, which is what we commonly use to sort of push out any of the presentations and um, any news that's going on in, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem. It is a not-for-profit. We do this, we're all volunteers who do this, and it's part of getting the ecosystem up. And the idea is hopefully you can come here, get a bit of information from them. One of the great presenters that we have. And then the after part is to then network. We are actually looking to um, put another event on the scene, which is, uh, we've got it penciled in, but uh, you saw it came out yesterday. Um, for those of you who find it very difficult to get up in the morning, we've now got to have a monthly um, uh, evening event called Dr. Disrupt, as it's kind of named now, and we're calling it the reverse pitch. And one thing that we've, we've definitely found in the ecosystem here in Perth is that Yourselves, you are the grassroots innovators, and the startups are finding it difficult to get access to the big corporates and get information from them and understand what your problems are. And in the same breath, the corporates are having problems trying to speak to you yourselves and how do you go about and engage with the startup because their procurement policies um, stop that. So, what Dr. Disrupt looks to do is essentially um, remove that. It's a two hour session. The first one is on the 9th here in Space Street at 6 o'clock. We've got our first corporate lined up. Um, I'll announce you that will be um, in a few weeks. And they're essentially going to pitch to you the five top five things that keep them up at night. And if you just sit there and listen, Dr. Disrupt will then interview them and clarify what that means and take questions from the, uh, from the, the audience. Uh, and then it's up to yourselves. If you think you've got the way to fix those problems and there's an opportunity there, basically these corporates are willing to put in money to try and help maybe prototype something or do an MOU uh, and then we're um, in a bit of understanding to see whether or not there is something to happen. The idea being is, is to build the ecosystem here in Perth and to create startups. So you may be an SME go, actually I can solve this problem and then they uh, I don't have a technical co-founder, there may be a technical co-founder goes, look, I can help build that, but I don't know, don't have the SME. So the idea is to, to, to create startups. So that's one announcement for the um, night. Um, I would recommend if RSVP, there are a set men, men, number of uh, spaces. We're already quarter full. We only been on for well, literally 12 hours, and we've already got 30 people RSVP. There's probably about 100, 110 that we can take. Um, are there any other announcements here in, in the ecosystem? Go on. Um, so I'm Bree Kirkman, and I run Happy Healthy Food. Um, on Thursday, I actually broke the world record for the most. Um, but I am also in the finals of Optus Be Up, and I've got cards, which I'll give you all afterwards. Um, if you guys can vote for me, it means that I win 15 grand if I get enough votes. Um, and the companies I'm up against have probably got a bigger, you know, their daily turnover is probably bigger than my annual turnover. So, um, yeah, it would mean a lot more to me. Yeah, we can get that out to the yeah. masses on social media and whatnot, yeah. so hopefully that. Let's, let's do something. Okay, I'll um, speak to us afterwards, we'll send it on the Facebook group, I'll send the message out to you. So we're now the biggest meetup group as well, business meetup group here in Perth, so I think that's worth a round of applause. I think we are one way from 60 members, so far the singles. 
Um, any other announcements? Do you want to recap? Start that weekend? I think I'll let you, Sam, as co-organiser. Thank you, man. Um, so Start That Weekend, if you're not familiar with it, is a weekend-long hackathon. You come along on a Friday night, you form teams, and by Sunday night you're expected to have generated some kind of revenue. So the most recent one in Perth was here on the weekend just gone, and we had about 100 people, about 40 people pitched ideas, and that got distilled down into 12 teams. One got disqualified straight away, they were out the door, bang, see you later. Uh, but he came back later on to make a special appearance. Uh, there's a longer story in there somewhere. Um, all 12 teams did brilliantly well. Uh, I think the guy that got disqualified and came back ended up making about 900 bucks in revenue just over the weekend. And uh, Cam, our speaker today, his team won, so he's got double kudos to uh, to be speaking with us this morning. And the next one will be about in six months' time. So if it's something you think you might enjoy, um, definitely come along. It's a brilliant way to, to literally start a company over a weekend, build a product, have a have customers, and um, Thoroughly enjoyed by all. Don't be sorry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tom. Hi, Tom. Uh, good morning. Tom Murrell is my name from ADM Media and Communications. Uh, I know this morning is about social media for startups, but tomorrow I'm presenting at a breakfast on social media for creating an endless pipeline of referrals. So if you want a business uh, B2B or professional services and you want to get lots of referrals, I'll be talking about things like LinkedIn and how to uh, generate referrals through that. It's tomorrow at 6.30 at World Perth Golf Club. Thank you. Any more before we jump into uh, Kath's presentation? Brilliant. Okay, um, let's say we'll continue to send out the announcements, but without further ado, I would like to uh, acknowledge, before I go any further, because I got shot down last week, and the week before we not acknowledging our key sponsors. And when I did it last week, they actually, none of them were here for some reason. It had something to do with the Melbourne Cup. So, I like to, uh, <laughs> Beecham Group, uh, who uh, will be providing the beers and nibbles on the night for us. Um, and also to Business News, Charlie um, is an avid supporter of the startup community. So, Charlie Gunningham, who is the CEO of Business News. If you've got a startup and you want to get it into Business News and get it showcased, um, just pick the phone up, speak to him, between Tim, he'll more than happily meet with you. And, and showcase your startup. Um, he does one every single, uh, I think it's every week on a Friday in the email, he does that sort of showcase. Um, space Cube, they give us this space for free, we couldn't do it without them. I uh, also recommend if, if you are interested in Flux, go and have a look over there, um, and because they're doing tours of it this week. And also Voltage Expresso, boutique coffee shop just across the road, not coffee shop, the one opposite, best coffee in town. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Well, morning everybody. Um, before we get started, if you'd like to follow along uh, with the slides, um, just grab your phone out and drop that little URL in there, pz.tt forward slash ammo start. It's a really good little um, Perth startup called Present. Um, that are an incredibly cool product for sharing uh, slides and offering comments and that sort of thing, so it's definitely worth trying out and supporting a local Perth startup. Um, just before I do get stuck into the content, um, it's actually really exciting for me to be speaking at the Morning Startup today. Uh, I think probably two and a half years ago, I came to my first Morning Startup. I was working a day job, and you know I was always kind of interested in tech, and, and there's a few little things happening around Perth, and it's exciting. And um, I think it was back when Isaac was running. Um, if anyone's sort of an old morning startup person, uh, they remember Isaac Jury, and uh, he's actually over in Melbourne now running his own startup um, type club. So it's it's really a, a nice way to stay in contact with the community, keep the flame alive when you're doing your day job, and it's kind of nice to hear other people's stories. And so it's really exciting that um, I'm finally able to present <coughs> startups and things like that. Um, I'm Cam Sinclair. Um, I'll probably just give you a quick sort of background on, on where I'm from and where I'm coming from, and then get um, yeah, stuck into some of the juicy stuff. Um, who has seen this in the past five or ten years? Probably not many people. It's, um, it's a bit of a old school IRC type thing from the, maybe the 90s. 
Um, anyone could be born in the 90s, but may not have ever seen it. Um, but it's, uh, it just popped into my head yesterday. I just thought, like, isn't it amazing how much the internet has changed in, in 15, 20 years? I mean, back when IRC was all the rage and you could just get on there and talk to complete random people. And, um, you know, you wouldn't know them from a virus, so you wouldn't even know what their age, sex, or location was. And you could strike up a conversation. And as it changed now, we've got Facebook, Twitter, you know, we actually, it's actually made the world smaller, not bigger. We can focus on the things that we're interested on in, rather than be open to new experiences. So it's actually kind of interesting the way things have changed and the way the internet and online life has kind of evolved over the past 20 years. So to answer that question of 28 in Perth, um, I was always a little bit of a nerd in high school. Um, you know, I was I kind of wanted to be one of the. I was an aspirational cool kid, I guess. <laughs> I was kind of friends with cool kids, but I wasn't a cool kid. Um, you know, one of the things I tried to do to endear myself to the cool kids at school uh, was at the height of the frenzy around Napster and MP3s. You could download music and listen to whatever you wanted. You could get it off the top forty radio station. Um, I decided it'd be cool to start an online rap, my own online radio station using downloaded music from Napster. And uh, I sort of convinced some mates of mine to help me set it up, and we used IceCast, and it was called Wakeswave. And it was using the WA internet traffic. It was actually free traffic for anyone with IINet or WestNet or WA internet providers back then. And uh, it went really well um, until we got sort of two or 3,000 uh, listeners regularly on a daily basis. Um, and we got, you know, a lot of attention, but then we started getting attention from the record labels, and they didn't really like us illegally streaming the music that we had illegally downloaded off Napster, uh, and then we were illegally sharing with everybody. Um, so that got shut down pretty quick, smart, uh, last maybe 18 months. But it was, it was a really cool sort of exercise in community building around using the internet and learning about what motivates people. Um, and what they enjoy um, getting involved in. Um, so after school, um, I went and uh, I didn't go to uni. I uh, went and worked in a sales position for a boring industrial company. I was 17 and I was out there sort of throwing, throwing myself in the deep end, selling big expensive industrial products to, to managing directors of companies, wondering what I was doing. Um, and I sort of started, this is about 2003, 2004, and I was like, guys, you could, there's a smarter way to do this. Um, you know, I was, we don't have a website, you know, we're not on Google. And I was sort of the young buck trying to tell the boss what to do, but he let me have a go at it and it kind of worked. I kind of started to realize that um, if marketing is a way of automating sales to a large extent, and if you do it properly, sales is really just, can just really be a closing exercise. Um, if you can build a brand and a story around your product or service and you have people coming to you and wanting to be a part of that, then really sales can just be a path to help them assist, uh, assist them through that process. And I've got guys like Tom here who are just sales geniuses and I've, I've never met you but I've you know, heard about you around town so speaking about this sort of thing in front of you and Miles as well is kind of scary but um, sort of as a young tacker it kind of seemed um, logical to me that you try and automate that process as much as possible and the face-to-face -face contact it's more just about building a relationship. So after a little while uh, working in sales uh, and, and getting really interested in marketing um, I decided I should probably go and study a little bit so I went and uh, studied marketing in Curtin um, where I actually kind of got interested in politics strangely enough um, and I started volunteering um, at election time and getting involved in that side of things uh, and eventually I actually scored a job um, and was offered a job and I thought well I'll, I don't want to do it as a career but I'll give politics a go for a few years to see, to see how I like it. Um, and so I worked in politics for maybe about seven years after the only wanted to do it for maybe one year. So there's a photo of me with, uh, with the former Prime Minister John Howard. Um, so I worked in Canberra for a little while, did speech writing, did a policy, um, but I kept coming back to that marketing side of things and 
um, you know, the ability to sort of broadcast a message to a wide range of people and change the way they behave. That's really what election campaigns are all about. And um, I sort of ran some of my own little grassroots campaigns, got involved in the community side of things. And I was eventually invited, I was offered a job at uh, the campaign headquarters here in WA. And politics is actually a bit of a mad world. It's, um, you live in a bubble, really. You don't have that much contact with reality. I can say that now, I'm not in it anymore. And um, you know, it's actually a little bit scary because you've got a small number of people who actually don't have, on the whole, a massive amount of real world experience. But they're making decisions for the rest of us. And so and my job was kind of to go, hang on guys, we've got to actually put this in a way that people understand and they relate to and that they, if we're going to change their behaviour, it needs to be about them and not about us. Um, so working as a campaign manager, um, funnily there's actually very few kind of resources at that campaign, election campaign level. All of the money goes into the TV advertising and uh, the other forms of advertising that we do. So the staff, uh, we rely heavily on consultants, but we've got to learn how to do a little bit of everything. So it was, it was really great I got to do TV ads, radio, direct mail, online stuff, um, and grassroots stuff, all the billboards and um, mobile outdoor advertising. Uh, so it gave me a really nice sort of broad range of experience in, in, uh, in, in marketing and advertising. It was fantastic. So I did that for uh, about five or six years, and um, that was way longer than what I wanted to do it for. And, but I'd always had that niggling sort of interest in tech, and I always wanted to run my own business. So I um, realised this sort of package of skills that I've learned up over the years is actually pretty useful to, um, to small businesses who are just starting out, because they need to know out of all the universe of different advertising and marketing media you can use, which one is going to give me the best bang for my buck? And how would you know that unless you've already been there and tried it out before or had someone on your side who, who knew that? So I started uh, Ammo Marketing. And I did that sort of part time on the side for a while and convinced my boss that I could go down to two or three days a week and do this on the side. Um, and uh, that was cool because it was kind of the first step and it was kind of like sitting on both sides of the fence, not giving up the wage completely but still being able to do what I wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, I thought um, a really nice way to do this would be rather than trying to sell a big project and earn a commission on advertising or building a website, why don't I just give people like a sort of flat rate so that they know that the advice that I'm giving is always going to be impartial and just really want to do what's best for them. Um, so that's what I've been doing for the past uh, 18 months. I've now left my job in politics and doing this full time. Um, and it's really great. It's actually a really great thing to, to uh, finally achieve. Uh, so I'm quite proud of it. I'm now able to work for myself essentially. Um, um, also, um, I got married a few weeks ago, which is really exciting. Um, and my uh, wife's a psychologist, she's an org psych. Um, and so we've been together for quite a while and I uh, sort of had the privilege of uh, spending eight years proofreading her assignments and helping her study for exams. And I guess kind of absorbed maybe a fifth of a psychology degree. Um, <laughs> So I guess the difference is she's been sworn to use psychology for good, and I'm kind of not bound by those kind of rules. So I can kind of use a little bit of psychology in my day job and uh, use it to help my clients. So what we're we'll going through today is maybe just a little bit of that psychology and how I do use it for marketing, how you guys can use it for your messaging, um, and how it can be useful just to think through the, some of these processes when you're writing any form of communications with your customers, especially if you're developing products. There's a lot of psychology that goes into that user experience and the language that you use, very subtle choice of language that you can use in your product development that can make a massive difference. Um, and you know, also your landing pages um, and uh, you know, just your general marketing material. Thinking through um, that kind of messaging is actually really powerful. Um, 
All right, so we talk about marketing. Um, a lot of people think about marketing as a project. It's a, it's a website or it's an advertising campaign. But I argue that it's actually a process that you need to build into your business from the ground up. Um, if you uh, go out and spend 20 grand on building your website uh, and then the company uses the website, there you go, fun with it, you get a little sugar rush of activity. But before long, unless you're actually working at it over time and adding content and promoting it over time, that sugar rush is going to wear off pretty quick. So if you're building this marketing process into your business from the ground up, you're going to get the benefits over, over a long period of time. Um, so has anyone heard of this concept? Yeah. Cool. Um, so this is something which uh, there's a guy who calls, I think it's the art of the pitch or pitch anything or something like this, talks about this. But it's also um, really a, 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 a cycle concept where uh, our brains essentially evolved over millions of years from um, you know, pretty primitive animals and the additional layers that have, that have been evolved into our brains uh, have made it more and more advanced. But at its base, our brain is really just a, an external um, stimulus filter. The light and sound and things that come through our nose and ears and everything else uh, is, for, is received by basically the brain. And within the first three seconds of receiving one of these stimuli, that part of the brain decides what to do, whether it's something that's worth paying attention to or something which is actually just um, something which you don't even need to think about. So, within that first three seconds, that part of the brain will decide whether, if, if we see like an object or a thing come at us out of nowhere, within that first three seconds, our brain will decide whether it's food, whether to fight it, or whether to fornicate with it. It's a sort of real basic survival instinct side of things that kicks in straight away. And if it's none of those things, or if it's not novel or interesting or something out of the ordinary, the likelihood is that we won't really start to process that information. We'll just, it, um, it, it will be ignored virtually. So the key to getting people to actually think about something a little bit deeper is stimulating this side of the brain, and then it actually works out, up and outwards to the more advanced parts of the brain. So once you've got their attention, then you can start to appeal to emotion, which is more the, the mammal side of the brain. So this is, this is the crocodile brain, this is maybe the mammal side of the brain, and this is the primate or more human side of the brain. So once, we're, once we've got their attention, we can start appealing to, uh, to emotion, um, which might mean um, that we're, you know, sort of, um, sorry, so, once we've got the attention, we appeal to emotion, and then once we've, we've achieved this, then we can actually start talking about facts and figures and appealing to the rational side of the brain. So, in advertising, if we start hitting people with numbers and facts and features, we might not even stimulate this side of the brain. We might not even start processing emotion, and then we definitely won't even get to the side where we can actually start thinking about the rational side of what we're actually trying to um, get across. So if we have a think about emotions, um, you probably, you'll notice that a lot of advertising really does appeal to people's emotional side. And, and that can be a wide range of things. Um, but the reason being is that um, and that's, what's, that's what actually allows people to start processing information. Um, we'll give you some examples. So, <laughs> straight away we've got this happy Jack who's getting stuck into a cheeseburger. He's pretty excited about it. And that captures our attention immediately. And it's only once we've sort of seen the happy smiley face that we start to get a little bit deeper into the information. And we've also got a, a phrase up there, Jimmy's mother knows McDonald's hamburgers are 100% beef. 
So, I mean, that's kind of a fact, but it's also kind of an emotional fact. Mum's being the maternal protective, she wants to make sure that her son's getting the best kind of nutritional value out of his meal. But Jimmy doesn't care about that stuff, he just knows that it's good. He's just excited to be munching on a cheeseburger. So this is like, this is a really old ad, this is about 30 years old, but some of the research um, that goes into emotional advertising is about 30 or 40 years old, and it shows that if you get appealed to that side of thing, uh, you've probably got an 80% greater chance of getting through your message. This is a really cool example as well. If you look at um, almost any airline advertising, they don't talk about the number of inches between a seat or what you're going to do that much when you're sitting on a plane or how big the engines are on the plane. They talk about the outcome that you're going to get from jumping on a plane and flying. They're going to, they're going to show you hanging out with your cool friends on the foreshore of Brisbane. They're going to talk about what you're at, the actual destination, really. That's the, and that's the cool key reason that you have to follow it. So that's really clever. That's, um, you know, you're not going to show a picture of the seat that you're sitting in when you're starting and playing because it's not going to sell tickets. <coughs> this, is a, this is a cool one, actually. They've actually kind of combined features with this nostalgic, warm, fuzzy feeling of, um, of your family history. A nice old photo dad and son have been swimming the lake. Um, so again, it's appealing to that emotional side of people, um, but getting straight into the people as well. This is an example of maybe what not to do. I, just, I, I thought I would show a sort of contrast. So straight away, we've got number one visual bookmarking tool. I kind of really don't know exactly what that is, and the tagline is collect images, means videos and texts you find online quickly. So it's kind of like just talking about the features straight up. It doesn't give you any emotion or feeling about how you're going to experience using that product. You've got a lady sort of hunched over a laptop uh, and the call to actions get started. And then they get straight into the features and get down here. So if they were to do this a little bit better, they might have the lady smiling and enjoying her experience with the product. And it might be, you know, um, always know where your great websites are stored, something along those lines. So it's actually getting to the crux of what the product achieves by using it. So that's why there's an old saying, features tell, benefits sell. So you're better off showing someone the benefit of using their product rather than just telling what the features are. So a few little examples to throw up. Um, this is a classic one for the tech industry. Talk about how much people brand has got or memory and how much it weighs and all this sort of thing. But to the average consumer, it doesn't really mean a great deal unless you're a tech brand. So the benefit to that is your music wherever you go. Same deal, cars. You can talk about V8 engines, 20-inch mad wheels, which is really cool if you're a you know if you're a bit of a rev head. But if you're a regular consumer, it doesn't mean a great deal. But feeling and seeing power is something which you can actually kind of relate to. And this might be an example for, for Zero cloud accounting software. Now, I know what that means, but my mum doesn't. But she would understand that it's a pleasure doing business or it's an easier, more effective, streamlined way of taking care of people. Um, another really practical way to use some of these things is call to actions. Um, you're probably 50% less likely to actually get people to do what you want them to do. So uh, it's that, that first three seconds kind of thing, if it's not immediately obvious that there's some action to be taken, uh, more often than not, people aren't going to go out of their way to hunt for, for your call to action. It needs to be there, it needs to smack them in the face on the struggle. But the content of that call to action is also kind of important as well. And um, there's a few sort of little tips that have, especially around A-B testing and things now that a lot of that's um, been really widespread. There's been some sort of research into what works just by way of texting on a button. And by the way, like, you should use a button um, rather than just an underlined hyperlink text. It's going to be so much more people. It's just so obvious that a button is there to be clicked. Um, so you've got to spell these things out. 
Yeah. So out of these, which ones do you think would be the most useful? <coughs> I guess you can probably tell. So <coughs> the ones that have just gone grey and ones to probably avoid if you can, and ones that are green. Well that style of button is going to be more likely to get a click. And like, it's worth noting that this isn't going to work for everybody, it's really going to depend on your product, your service and your brand story. But, um, and I would highly recommend A-B testing the crap out of everything. But as a general rule, this kind of direction is going to help. So rather than telling people what to do on your site, send, submit, shop, have people in their head telling the site what to do. So they're the ones that are in control. Grow my traffic, get my free, try it free. So it's just a subtle change in language that can actually make all the difference in getting people to do what you want to do. Um, here's an example of, of actually a pretty good landing page that's, that's worked really well. And they've got their call to action in their header there, which is, for SEO and stuff, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually really plain. And going back to that, that crocodile brain, it's just very simple stimulus that you can it's all really quickly and easily you know what you want to do. And it's kind of showing the benefits. You don't have a happy smiley face, but you can kind of experience the ease that is going on there. This is another really cool example actually. Who plays Candy Crush? Anyone? It's kind of like the ice of the um, mobile gaming world. It's pretty big to what I've been told. Um, and this is just like a comparison of this is Candy Crush on this side and this is a different game. But just the subtle changes in language and um, this is actually a bit of a negative tension happening here on this side. So here we're saying that, oh, you're out of moves, you didn't meet Cinderella, continue. They're not really creating a compelling reason to, to meet Cinderella, it's kind of negative. You know? so it sounds like it's going to be hard to continue. Whereas on this side, we're saying you're out of moves, you only need three more ingredients. What is it, nine more ingredients? So there's kind of like this incentive to keep going, and there's play on or give up. <laughs> I mean, which one are you going to do? And you know, the play on is the big green button. It's a lot easier to do that than to give up and let this poor little mouse down or the princess or whatever it is. <laughs> so, They've really thought this through, and that's why they're the crack cocaine of, of <laughs> mobile gaming. Because they, they're creating this kind of incentive <laughs> and attacking into people's motivations. Um, speaking of motivations, um, one of the first sort of psych 101 lessons that they give you is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is, um, this is really, you know, it's, it's a little bit basic nowadays, but it, kind of, it does sum up how you can motivate people to do things. Um, the way it works is you, is you basically start at the base. So this is the requirements for human survival, you know, water, food, shelter, air. And if you don't have those things, you're not going to care about much else. You're going to care about getting water. But once those sort of things are satisfied and you're, you're, you're alive and you're breathing and you're happy, next level is safety, security. So this might be things like um, you know worrying whether you're gonna your house is gonna be burgled or whether you're gonna be safe walking down the street or whether you have financial security. So you notice that actually a lot of uh, when you turn on the news, the six o'clock news, quite often the leading story is gonna be about violence or a car crash or terrorism, something like that. And it's not very pleasant stuff, but the thing is that's actually what motivates people at a very base level. So it's actually what will get people to turn on the news and watch it, and that's why it kind of works. And unfortunately, that's kind of what happens in politics as well. You kind of play with these things. But once all that's satisfied, then we move up the pyramid a little bit more. So love and belonging. This is where Facebook really taps into people's psyches, right? And then, and then the steam. So this is sort of like this is sport, and um, you know, you're part of a tribe, and or you've got a you know, a loving partner and that sort of thing, your family. And this is sort of feeling good about yourself, that you're a capable human being, you can 
uh, other people recognize you as someone to look up to or to, to be uh, around. And then at the very top, self-actualization. Am I the best human that I can possibly be? Um, you know, am I donating to charities or am I having a greater impact beyond my own sphere of influence? Um, am I leaving a worthwhile legacy? So these kind of things, all products kind of will fit into one of these categories. And when you're developing your messaging and your brand, kind of think about what people's motivations are along this line and how you can kind of tap into that. And this is a great example of that sort of love, belonging, esteem side of things, social proof. And if you look at any website of any good high-level tech company, they will have social proof on their site. So what's social proof? It's testimonials. It's logos, authority, and it's customer reviews. It's all that kind of thing. Other people are using this product, so it's going to be okay if you use it as well. There's nothing more powerful than a third party saying good things about you. You can say all the good things you like about you, but it's actually about the source. It's about where that message is coming from. And if it's from one of your friends or someone you know or someone that you trust, that message is going to be 10 times more powerful than anything that you can say yourself. So that's why reviews are really great um, on a lot of e-commerce stores. You know, customers also bought this or, um, you know, this is the average rating for this product. Um, you know, having a big, big main logo on your site, that's pretty cool, that's pretty conspicuous. But the reason that this stuff works is, is this kind of stuff here, other people. Uh, you know, saying that it's cool and then that one is cool. Kind of still got a little bit of that herd mentality in us. So, to recap, we've got that crocodile brain, getting tap, tapping into that base stimuli and getting people's attention. And if I was to grab that chair and chuck it across the room, <laughs> there's even danger for everybody, you're going to stimulate that crocodile brain. And, and you need to stimulate that before you can start appealing to emotion and before you can start appealing to people's rational thought processes. So there's those emotions again. <clears throat> Having a think about how you want people to feel when they're first experiencing your product. Or, or what their emotions are when they think about the end product of using your product. Or the end result of using your service. And motivation. Why would they hand over their hard earned dollars in the first place? What's that core um, uh, sort of base level human need for your product and how to Alright, just to getting pretty close to the end, um, I thought I might share a couple of little handy tools that I use every uh, every day at work um, for my clients. Unbounce is awesome. Uh, this is all about landing pages. So they've got some really great templates of things that they have tested in the past, um, which, which just convert much better than anything else. So talking about those buttons, having them above the fold, having a really clean, easy, form, very clear message at the top. Um, and what Unbounce allows you to do is A-B test, which means you've got version A, version B, 50% go out to random users and then you start to see different results from both pages. And you want to go with the one that obviously gives you the best return. But it's kind of like science experiment all the way through. Um, and that's really what marketing is becoming. It's less an art nowadays and more a science because hopefully everything is measurable. So Unbounce is great. There's others out there, but I just use Unbounce. Marketingstack.io is a really cool resource. Um, this was up on Product Hunt a few months ago. And it's just basically um, an ongoing list of all the best marketing tools and services that are out there. Um, and I check it out every week just to see if there's anything here that's worthwhile. And some really good articles on there as well, worth having a look at. And kind of the latest buzzword for the past year or so in digital marketing is, is retargeting. Um, if you're spending a lot of money and effort driving people to your website, um, they might only stay once. And so how do you get them back? Well, retargeting will actually chuck a little cookie in their browser and they'll remember that you visited your site 
and then once you start going to your news sites or your BuzzFeed or whatever else, your ads might start popping up on that page. So it's a really nice way to extend the effectiveness and it's an extremely cost effective way of bringing people who you already know are interested in your product uh, back to your site. So it's becoming pretty mainstream now. Facebook and AdWords do, do that sort of thing. It's kind of annoying, but it's because it works. <laughs> so that's me. Um, I thought I'd run a little experiment just on my logo. Um, does anyone see the, what the lines um, sort of make up there? Trying to work out whether it's actually yeah. Cool. So the lines work out to say ammo, A N O N. Um, the reason I do that is if you've kind of engaged that level with the logo, hopefully you'll be more likely to remember the brand and the name. Um, well, that's my talk. I'm happy to take some questions. And um, thanks very much for having me.